Marijuana. <laughs> All right. So you're going to see this more and more. Um, goes by lots of different names, Mary Jane, pot, hemp, uh, grass. And remember that THC um, is going to directly affect our cannabinoid receptors. When it comes to the neurotransmitters that it affects, it typically affects your dopamine, serotonin, and GABA, and it results in either stimulatory or inhibitory signs. The good thing about marijuana specifically is that only 50 is massive. The LD50 is thought to be greater than three grams per king, which is 1,000 times the effective dose. So it's really hard for a patient to die of marijuana poisoning, but they become clinical at really low doses. We don't even know what the toxic dose is, which is why I don't believe in medicinal marijuana use in pets. If we don't know what a toxic dose is, it's really hard to identify what a therapeutic dose is. Please keep in mind this is different than some of the CBD oils that you may see out there. CBD oils typically are stripped of THC, okay? So they're not gonna see marijuana poisoning necessarily with that. Um, but with specific THC poisoning, um, clinical signs can happen really quickly. So within a few hours, and they can last for one to two days. Now, most of the time when we see exposure, it's gonna be by inhalation, that's rare. Um, most of the time it's gonna be ingestion of baked goods. So uh, butter, um, the buns directly, or any kind of um, baked good product. I will say marijuana butter has really high levels of THC. Marijuana is very lipophilic, so when you boil um, buns and then you add butter on top, it traps all the THC directly in the butter so people can just spread it onto baked goods. The few fatalities that have been published in veterinary medicine with marijuana are from, baked, from butter. Okay, so you want to treat butter more aggressively. Now, you guys probably all know Colorado was the first state to decriminalize medicinal marijuana. And so Meolinol out of, um, out of Wheat Ridge and Colorado State published this study back in JVAC, gosh, almost 17 year, uh, seven years ago. And what they ended up seeing was 125 dogs that were poisoned by marijuana. The two that died were butter ingestions. And in my opinion, based on reading this paper, they were savable, but the owner couldn't afford to ventilate the patient. Um, they also saw a fourfold increase in marijuana toxicity since the decriminalization. And so more and more states are going to see more marijuana poisoning in dogs. There were also two studies by Lee and all, a different Lee, who's a human pediatrician in Colorado, and they've reported severe um, CNS signs in children less than two getting into baked goods, and it's from marijuana. So uh, just be very, very cognizant of it. I apologize, this, this slide's a little to the left, but biggest clinical signs, 90% presented ataxic, 50% with mydriasis, disorientation, 30% uh, with tremors. Even though people will use medicinal marijuana as an anti-nausea or anti-emetic, um, it actually was interesting in this Miola study, 30% of dogs presented vomiting, okay? To me, the most life-threatening clinical signs are bradycardia and hypoventilation. I've had some cases that uh, you almost have to intubate through that sedate. What's pathognomonic? A dribbling urine dog. Dog comes in, the owner's like, oh, he's dribbling urine. Unless you ask the questions to make sure it's not a proen insufficiency, in this scenario, any dog that's walking drunk or wiggity that's dribbling urine is marijuana until proven otherwise. So in general, dogs will do two things. They'll get super, super sedate and comatose, or they'll get wiggity and, jigger, and jiggity and like hyperesthetic and they're seeing flies, okay? In this scenario, I might potentially give them trazodone or some type of anti-anxiety drug if they're very, very sedate, most of the time they need to sleep it off with supportive care. And most of those patients will do well. Um, what blood tests do we do? I don't usually use, do any blood tests with these guys. I usually tell people um, if I ask an appropriate history and they're like, nope, nope, no marijuana case, no marijuana exposure, people always say, well, should I do the urine drug screens? I don't love these tests. These are human qualitative tests. They're not quantitative. They're what you buy from CVS or Walgreens when you don't trust your teenager and you want to urine dipstick them. They typically test for three to five things, 
heroin, PCP, cocaine, marijuana, and I forget anyone, crystal meth. The problem is there's a lot of false positives. You have a lidocaine patch on your patient, it's going to test positive for cocaine. Dog got into trazodone or ibuprofen, it's going to test positive for PCP. Dog has a fentanyl patch on, it's going to test positive for um, opioids. Okay, so a lot of false positives with it. These tests are also different uh, from our veterinary tests. One dash is positive, two dashes is a negative control, is negative. Um, the unusual thing with marijuana is it undergoes a different metabolite in dogs, eight delta versus 11 delta. So if you see a positive, it's a true positive, but most of the time we see false negatives. All right. You can occasionally see false positives from hemp-containing food, from proton pump inhibitors. You can see false positives with the FDA-approved anti-nausea medication. And again, most of the time, if they're really, really uh, wiggity, I will sedate them a little bit. So a little bit of acepromazine or butorphanol or dextome or whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, but most of them just need nursing care. So heat support, flipping, flipping them, lubing their eyes, ECG monitoring to make sure they're not too bradycardic, um, making sure they don't need to be ventilated, and I'd say that's relatively rare. Uh, with severe hypoventilation, I base it on an end tidal CO2 or venous blood gas. If they can't blow off their CO2, if their pulse ox is low, less than 92, uh, they can't exchange oxygen well, that's a patient that should potentially be ventil ventilated. If they're really, really bradycardic, I'll give a few doses of atropine. If they're really tachycardic, check a blood pressure. They may need a fluid bolus. They may need a beta blocker. But ultimately, the prognosis is fair to good, even with marijuana poisoning.